Dear colleagues, I would like to welcome you also in this uh, webinar event. It's a very, it's a rather unusual way of communicating, but let's say that the last month, this is the only way we have. We will have the chance to talk on the next moment about hyperkeratosis. We know that skin is the most extensive organ of the body, and it, uh, let's say its structure and its thickness may vary according to the anatomic site which is present. And therefore also the effects that hyperkeratosis has may vary. Let's focus now on hyperkeratosis, which is a histopathological term defining a thickened stratum corneum and may be present in many different skin conditions with many possible overlaps. Hyperkeratosis can be associated with dyskeratosis, which is a premature or abnormal keratinization of individual keratinocytes, or with other abnormalities in the skin biopsy, such, for example, uh, with epidermal hypertrophy, a ben benign alteration of the skin that presents with acanthosis and hyperkeratosis. It can be due to several exogenous as well as endogenous processes, and it is related to increased production of keratin at the outer portion of the skin layer. It is mostly due to chronic physical or chemical damage, for example, friction, aggressive soaps, or tattoos, chronic inflammation, like in case of psoriasis or atopic dermatitis, side effects of different drugs, chemotherapic drugs, immunomodulators, and the most recent immune checkpoint inhibitors, and to nutritional deficits, the most frequent one is lack of uh, vitamin A. Regarding the epidemiology, the incidence is unknown as hyperkeratosis is the histologic aspect of many different pathologies, both benign or malignant. We can distinguish two types, the orthokeratotic type, which is characterized by thickening of the keratin layer with preserved keratinocyte maturation, and the parakeratotic type, which is characterized by retained nuclei as a sign of delayed maturation of keratinocytes. We know that the stratified epithelium is in a constant process of self-renewing and exfoliation that takes 20 to 40 days to complete. The cells in the outer layer are the most differentiated in the keratinocyte line, composed almost entirely of keratin lamels of high molecular weight. Those keratinocytes are the ones that undergo desquamation, completing the maturation cycle. When the epidermis is exposed to re repetitive injury, it is usually elicits an increased proliferative rate of keratinocytes and acceler accelerates the mat their maturation. Keratinocytes also tend to produce more keratin, thus increasing the stratum corneum thickness. Acute injury results to edema, which is tra translated into spongiosis, while chronic injury results in epidermal hyperplasia, resulting in acanthosis, accompanied by ortho- or parakeratosis. Genetic mutations can also result in hyperkeratosis, as it happens in ichthyosis and keratoderma, where, for example, uh, genes KRT1 and 2 are mutated. And therefore, histopathology varies according to the reason, the cause of the hyperkeratosis. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through in detail, but we do see different histopathology if it happens to be mechanical hyperkeratosis, of psoriasis and psoriasiform dermatitis, Interphase and lichenoid dermatitis, verruca vulgaris and plana, seboroid keratosis, ichthyosis, and squamous cell carcinoma. If we try to translate this in our clinical applications, and here we see the tree of dermatological diseases, we can see that hyperkeratosis can be present in different kinds of, our, of the diseases of the dermatological spectrum, let's say. We can have it in non infectious diseases like papulous squamous diseases or autoimmune diseases. We can have it in infective diseases like fungal diseases, malignant or benign neoplastic diseases, or others like general dermatosis. And here we see a list of the most common ones, and we find among them simple, let's say, diseases like callus and corn, then keratosis plantare, chronic folliculitis, 
more complex inflammatory diseases like atopic dermatitis, psoriasis and psoriasiform dermatitis, lichen planus and lichenoid dermatitis, keratosis pilaris, ichthyosis, seboroid keratosis, actin keratosis, keratoacanthoma, paraneoplastic syndrome, squamous and basal cell carcinoma. And we all come to see in our daily clinical practice images like this that are the result of these different diseases in hyperkeratosis in the skin. Which is now the prognosis and which are, can be the complications of a hyperkeratotic uh, feature? The prognosis is related to the specific dermatological disease that is causing hyperkeratosis. It usually improves with treatment, but in some cases may be persistent and it can relapse. Therefore, patient has to be informed about this. Moreover, the cosmetic appearance of hyperkeratosis, especially when exposed areas such as the face, scalp, and neck are affected, may cause significant psychosocial distress and therefore affect the quality of life of the patient. Moreover, scaring secondary to the traumatic manipulation of the lesion from the patient can occur. It is important for the diagnosis to get a very detailed history. History and clinical evaluation play a very important role, and the main goal remains to collect as much information as possible in order to arrive in a correct diagnosis, and therefore to the most appropriate treatment. In some cases, clinical diagnosis may be sufficient, while in other cases, a biopsy, thermoscopy, or patch test can be useful for the diagnosis. In to the history of the patient, we should include the following information. The age of the patient, family history, exposure to toxic substances or drugs, occupational duties, anamnesis of the current lesions, as well as concomitant diseases and treatment. Regarding the management of hyperkeratosis, patients should be educated that basic skincare measures such as hygiene, hydration, exfoliation are important to maintain functional skin even in the affected area. Instructions for the other precautions should be given based on specific dermatological diagnosis this is normal to think of. Initial treatment usually consists of emollients and topical keratolytics such as uh, salicylic acid or urea and the patient is being re-evaluated. In the case that there is no response to general topical measures, then depending to the diagnosis, therapy can include either topical corticosteroids or vitamin D derivates, as well as retinoids, topical anti-inflammatories like calcineurin inhibitors, phototherapy, laser treatments, immunomodulators, or even surgical procedures. So in conclusion, we need to say that hyperkeratosis is a complex histopathological term defining a thickened stratum corneum and may be present in many different skin conditions with many possible overlaps. Patients, therefore, should be educated that basic skincare measures is of great importance. They are of great importance as a first-line treatment and in monotherapy, but also in combination with other topical, pharmacological, or systemic treatments. We must say that emollients and keratolytics play a very important role in the management of hyperkeratosis, and we will have the chance in the next presentation of Professor Mikhail to see the role of urea, which is one of the most commonly used keratolytics and emollients to uh, this kind of affection. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>